After a four-year apprenticeship in signal engineering with British Rail, he held multiple signal engineering positions until early retirement from Network Rail in 2014. So one employer for you all your working life. Indeed. That's something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. He joined the British Astronomical Association in 1984 and contributed to their solar section between 1990 and 2000, also sharing his observations with the solar division of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Uh, other favourites are observing eclipses, transits and planetary conjunctions. In 2002, he was a founder member of the Society for the History of Astronomy and was also elected, <coughs> excuse me, Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. The next year saw him licensed to operate the Orwell Park Refractor, the uh, IAU Observatory Number 582, on behalf of the Orwell Astronomical Society in Ipswich, which he had joined several years earlier. 2017 and between 2017 and 2019, he received the SHA Roger Jones Award for contributions to their county survey of astronomers. An early foray into astronomical history was a biography of Charles May, and more recent work has been on Fiamenta Wilson and Alice Grace Cook, the subject of this evening's talk, as I'm sure you know. Bill has a particular soft spot for classic refracting telescopes, such as the Carl Zeiss Telementor and the Q-Star Muxutov Cassegrains. He owns some astronomical antique antiques, usually eyepiece micrometers planet spheres or similar teaching aids. He also has more old astronomical books than he likes to admit. <laughs> in January 2020, he was appointed as the Deputy Director of the British Astronomical Association Historical Section. So can everybody please put their hands up and welcome Bill Barton. Thank you very much for that introduction. And for some reason, the presentation has decided to start at the end. So I'm going to have to kind of scroll back to the beginning. That's OK. So uh, if you'll give me a, a few minutes. <clears throat> so, um, yes, by uh, way of uh, introduction, not that I need one after that uh, excellent introduction. Um, the British Astronomical Association, as you uh, are well aware, um, consists of various observing sections. So for the Sun, the Moon, uh, Jupiter, Saturn and so on. But we also have an historical section. Uh, the BAA itself started in 1890 and um, the historical section started in uh, 1930 uh, when it was realised that the BAA's library contained several uh, it, historically interesting uh, volumes um, and a an, uh, director was appointed as uh, a lady called Mary Evershed. She was our first director and um, we now have a director and a deputy director. So the director is a chap called Mike Frost and I'm his deputy. Um, and again, we're, we're a bit unusual compared to other sections in the that officially there are only two of us, myself and Mike, um, but we have a, a large group of uh, interested followers um, in the region of uh, 5,050, uh, sorry, 550 at the moment, um, who uh, receive our section publications and we encourage them to research the history of astronomy um, and to write papers for the Journal of the British Astronomical Association. Um, just to give a plug to another society, um, Roy in his uh, introduction mentioned the Society for the History of Astronomy, and this started in 2002, to really to record the, the kind of grassroots um, of historical astronomy. 
So it, this is not the, the big people, the astronomer royals and the William Herschels of this world, but the chap down the road 20 years ago who had a telescope. Um, and so one of their uh, projects is the county survey of astronomers in which they seek to record these really quite ordinary people, but people who, some of whom made uh, create uh, contributions to the astronomy. Um, and so the subject of, of my talk this evening, hopefully you can see my title slide there. Yes, thank you. Good. So this is a lady called Alice Grace Cook. And the subtitle for the talk is Beer, Bread and Bolides. So beer is what you get as part of the process of malting. Bread you get from uh, milling flour. And bolides is a technical term for very bright uh, shooting stars, which was Alice Grace Cook's uh, very interest in astronomy. And so this is the overview of the talk. Um, I'll talk about her family background, the observatory that she had, how she came to join the BAA, some of her observing colleagues within the association, her entry into the Royal Astronomical Society. One particular object that she observed, a nova in the constellation of Aquila. Her later observing career and work in the meteor section of the BAA, other societies that she joined, and finally uh, a summary of the talk. So this is uh, Suffolk, where Alice Grace Cook came from. Um, so the sticky out bit into the North Sea, um, just above Essex. So she was born in the Stowmarket town, the town of Stowmarket in 1877, and she died in Ipswich in 1958. So pre-First World War to post-Second World War. And on the right there, you see a not particularly good image of her. Um, Certainly before the First World War, photography was really quite a rare hobby. Very few photographs of, of certain people were taken. Um, and this is one of the few of uh, Alice that we have. So zooming in a bit onto the county of Suffolk, um, you can see I've put a, a red dot on Stowe Market, which is uh, around 15 miles northwest of the county town of Ipswich which is where I was born and in pre-COVID times where I lived. Um, to put some sort of scale on this, Ipswich has got around 130 inhabitants and Stowe Market around 13,000. So this is Alice Grace Cook's family tree and you can see I've highlighted her name in red uh, in the lower quarter up there. Grace Cook's parents were, as you can see, Francis Ryder Cook and Alice Charlotte Lingwood. They married in Stowe Market in 1869. Francis came from Whitechapel in East London and was one of 11 children in the Cook family. Their father, Edward, ran a business making soap and disinfectants from the byproducts from the Beckton gasworks. A secondary concern manufactured artificial manure. It is the business by 1861 was su sufficiently successful that they employed 32 men and boys, which included Edward's own sons. After Edward's death in 1868, Francis Ryder and his younger brother James left the, the business and came to Suffolk. And uh, this is a rather unusual quirk in history here in the, in the 1860s in uh, East Anglia, we had a thing called the Coprolite Rush. So no doubt you've heard of the gold rush in uh, America. Well, th this was uh, people moving into the county to mine 
coprolites. Coprolites are mummified dinosaur poo. And it was discovered that you could process these chemically to produce artificial agricultural fertilizers. Francis stayed on in Stowe Market and continued trading on his own account after leaving a business partnership with his brother. On the other hand, Grace Cook's mother's family came from Battisford, not too far from Stowe Market, and it is presumed that uh, business relations between uh, one family producing artificial manure and the other family being farmers, uh, being uh, customers, um, brought uh, Alice, Charlotte Lingwood and Francis Ryder Cook together. Um, so as you can see, the, uh, both Francis Ryder Cook and his wife quite, had quite large family, uh, 11 on one side and 14 on the other. However, their family was comparatively small, uh, a son, two daughters, and finally another son. So here we see the family business. Um, the, at the very bottom of the picture there, is Stowe Market Railway Station. And the tall building on the left used to be a flour mill. And the smaller building on the right uh, was the maltings. And you can just about see, certainly on the right there, that he's put F.R. Cook and Company painted quite prominently on the roof. So Sarah Lingwood, uh, who was Alice Grace Cook's grandmother, owned a telescope and an astronomical reference book. And in the course of her uh, inheritance, the reference book came into Alice Grace Cook's hands, but unfortunately, the telescope didn't. In the autumn of 1909, Grace Cook attended lectures given by Joseph Alfred Hardcastle. <clears throat> now Hardcastle made a living traveling around the UK giving lectures and of course in those days there was very little if any communication between adjacent towns and so what you could do is write a course of lectures, deliver it in one town and then pack up move to a town 10 or 15 miles away and the next week give an identical set of lectures because the people in the second town would no, had no way of knowing the content of your lectures. And um, not only was Hardcastle doing this, um, but also a chap called Sir Robert Ball gave lectures and I believe his lecture career was something like 60 years long, um, just going around the country giving the same lectures over and over again, perhaps um, if there's an astronomical event coming up, he might drop a slide in of an uh, approaching eclipse or something to make it a bit more relevant. <clears throat> but there's a bit of a problem with, with giving evening lectures for the lecturer that you've got essentially nothing to do during the day. And so at the end of the first lecture, Hardcastle made an announcement to his audience that if there was anybody particularly interested in the subject, uh, and was free during the day, they'd be welcome to come to his, uh, his lodgings and uh, go further into some of the subjects he was talking about in his lectures. And so at the end of the first lecture, about 10 or 12 people from Stowe Market said, yes, we'd like to come along. But certainly Grace Cook seems to have been the uh, most interested of his uh, participants. Um, a few years earlier, you can, you can see from the image there, um, there was a thing called the Franklin Adams Project. And this was a very early attempt to photograph the entire night sky from stations, both in the UK and I believe the Southern Hemisphere was done from uh, Cape Town in South Africa. Um, something like a, a six inch aperture lens onto a photographic plate. And of course, at those times, 
people didn't really know what things were in the sky apart from the stars. And some of the stars, that they didn't even know how far away they were either. And so the only thing you could do was to go through all the photographic plates, look at objects which weren't stars, and try and classify them. And so within the entire Franklin Adams photographic archive, there were 206 plates uh, containing images of 785 nebulous objects. These were classified as spiral, elongated, diffuse, or small. And in later publications, Hardcastle actually said that, that Grace Cook undertook the majority of this classification work. Uh, Cook and Hardcastle remained in uh, correspondence until Hardcastle died. At the encouragement of Joseph Hardcastle, uh, Grace Cook joined the British Astronomical Association on the 22nd of February 1911. So this is the house that she was living in at the time um, on a road called Tavern Street in Stowmarket. It's an early 17th century house which was refronted and the interior modelled in the late 18th century. And it is of sufficient architectural interest that it is currently grade two star listed. I'm not quite sure when the Cook family moved to this residence. Um, Grace Cook's birth address from 1877 is actually given as a different house, but they were leased, at least here from 1891 and through till 1920. The property, as you can see, fronts directly onto the street, but at the time the Cook family were living here, it had a very large rear garden. And at the further encouragement of Hardcastle in 1913, Grace Cook applied to the British Astronomical Association to have one of their lone telescopes. When the BAA first started, they discussed having their own observatory um, but they could never quite decide where it should be or uh, what size instrument it should have and so on and so forth. But they ended up with uh, a large collection of astronomical instruments. And so Grace Cook asked if she could have instrument number 27. It's known as the Pennington Refractor because uh, that's the family who willed it to the uh, BAA following the death of the original owner. It's quite a magnificent telescope. It's five inches aperture and seven feet to uh, ten inches focal length. Um, the instrument that came from the BAA was literally just the telescope and the mounting and so Grace Cook had to construct her own observatory for it and you can see in the picture there she is in her somewhat Heath Robinson uh, observatory. Um, the roof actually slid off in two sections. And unfortunately, that meant that if you were observing an object as it crossed the meridian, you had to stop for a few minutes and readjust the telescope either side of an immovable roof support. So this is the work that she was doing with the telescope. She studied the moon, the sun, the planet Saturn, and she was also interested in the aurora, atmospheric phenomena, so rainbows and halos and things like that, and also meteors. Um, so at the uh, top right there, you can see her drawing of the lunar, plan uh, lunar crater Clavius, and the lower two images show her observing a sunspot as it tracks across the surface of the sun. Um, and the uh, sharp eyed of you may be able to see in the lower right corner of the lunar image, 
um, a little monogram A G inside a, a C, um, and that's certainly been very useful to, to me as a, a historical astronomer. If you ever see that uh, in a drawing, because um, she published in in quite a few different places, you see that you think, oh yeah, that's obviously one that's been done by Alice Grace Cook. The Pennington refractor remained in the BAA's loan collection um, until it was uh, wound up only a few years ago. And uh, it was borrowed by the gentleman that you can see there on the right, a chap called Mike Hendry. Um, I vaguely knew him back in the 1980s. Um, and he had it uh, not too far from Stowe Market, um, down in Essex at Colchester. Um, and he was director of the BIA comet section. Um, but unfortunately, his observatory was damaged in a storm in, back in 1987. So what did Miss Cook do within the BIA? Well, <clears throat> one of the things that she did was to either propose uh, people who were interested in astronomy to be members of the BIA or if somebody else had proposed them um, and she knew them personally, then she would second the application. And so here is a table of people that uh, she was involved in being elected into the BIA. So uh, it's a complete list. Uh, some of the names are more interesting to discuss than the others. The second list name down there is uh, Basil Brown. Um, he was interested in astronomy, and I'll, I'll talk more about him later. Um, but unfortunately, in the 1930s, uh, he literally ran out of money and astronomy. He couldn't carry on doing any astronomy, but he turned to archaeology, which is a subject that he could earn money from. And he's best known for uh, excavating the Sutton Hoo burial ship. Um, the next name down there, J.P.M. Prentice, uh, this chap is always just known by his initials. He uh, became BAA Meteor Section Director himself. Uh, passing over Mr. Brockman, we come to Edward Collinson. Um, he is perhaps best known within the BAA as being the president in the 1950s. He was Mars section director between 1956 and 79. Um, but if you dig down into his observing career, you also find that um, he was a prodigious uh, variable star observer. Um, probably even before the 1920s, he was observing variable stars and right up until the time of his death in the 1980s. Um, there's a name, a few more names down there. This man chap called uh, Arthur Bennett. Um, I'll talk more about him as well. Um, he was BAA treasurer um, on two occasions. And after the 1920s, um, Alice Grace Cook's astronomical career went into somewhat of a decline. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll throw more light on that later. But uh, in the 1930s, she uh, supported the election of uh, George Alcock to the BIA. Um, George Alcock's extremely famous observer within the BIA, his observing career. As you can see there, I've rather um, summarized it in, in extremely short order by saying that he discovered five novae and five comets. But again, I'll talk more about him later. So one of Alice Grace Cook's uh, observing colleagues was this lady, Fiametta Wilson. Um, she was born in Lowestoft in 1864. And after a rather complicated personal life, um, she became known as Fiametta Wilson. Um, she changed both her surname twice because she was twice married, but she also changed her Christian name as well. And she was particularly interested in observing meteors or shooting stars. Um, her principal ob observing site was um, in Barnet in northwest London. 
And as you can see, I, I put a note there that she was Chaldean Society Observation Director. And the Chaldean Society is something, uh, something that I will talk more of again uh, later in this presentation. Here is uh, Basil Brown. <clears throat> um, recently, he's become a little bit more famous. Uh, we've had a Hollywood film called The Dig, um, focusing on his work at Sutton Hoo. So he was born in 1888 uh, in Buckleshire, just east of Ipswich. Um, but at an early age, his family moved to Ricking Hall, which is just on the Suffolk-Norfolk border. Um, he was sufficiently interested in astronomical history that uh, he carried on a correspondence with many, it said many great astronomers, not only in, in this country, but uh, also on the continent. Um, he could speak four or five European languages reasonably fluently. Um, and so he could not only speak the languages, but he could also uh, read the foreign languages as well. And in the 1930s, he, he wrote this book, Astronomical Atlases, Maps and Charts, which is uh, a kind of review history of uh, astronomical mapping, uh, not only of the night sky, uh, but also planets and, and the moon. Um, but after 1935, um, his meagre income dried up completely and he was forced to uh, go to the museum in Ipswich, knock on the door and say, have you got any work that I could possibly do? The museum curator said, well, what we'll do, we will employ you as a gallery attendant, standing next to the exhibits and maybe answering questions, but you are basically free to carry on your own programme of work. And so he travelled around Suffolk on a bicycle. He never owned a motor car. And um, it was every, uh, every archaeological site across the county he probably knew from first-hand experience. Uh, he was released from duties uh, at the museum in 1938 to work privately um, at Sutton Hoo. Um, and of course, I can say the uh, usual phrase at this point, all the rest is history. This is another of uh, Grace Cook's, Grace Cook's observing colleagues, a man called Roland Clarkson. Um, he was born in uh, the Suffolk town of Beckles in 1889. Um, and again, he seems to have come to astronomy uh, through traveling lectures, but this time, um, by Sir Robert Ball. He accumulated nearly 50 years worth of observing notebooks taken with the instrument shown here, a mere six and a half inch uh, Newtonian reflector on an undriven altazimuth mount. His particular interest was the moon um, and unfortunately, his uh, magnum opus on lunar formation uh, was rejected by the BIA and never published in their journal. Um, after the Second World War, uh, an astronomical society started up in Ipswich and he was president of this group between 1950 and 1954. His uh, chap called Arthur Bennett, again a colleague uh, not only of Grace Cook but also of uh, Basil Brown. He came from Yorkshire and his uh, profession was that of engineering works manager. He had uh, several uh, different employments and uh, one leaving present he was given on leaving one particular company was a three inch refracting telescope. So this got him introduced to astronomy. When he came to Suffolk to work at uh, Garrett's Engineering Works at Leiston, he upgraded the three inch refractor, first of all, to a four inch 
and then a six inch Cook refractor. He observed lunar occultations, uh, but his particular uh, passion was spectroscopy of the sun. So aim the refractor at the sun, attach a spectroscope to the back and record either prominences or hydrogen alpha activity on the solar surface. Um, as was the habit, uh, a lot of, the, of these grand amateurs in the mid 20th century, he submitted annual reports to the Royal Astronomical Society of the work done at his observatory during the preceding years. So for nearly a decade, he sent these reports in to the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, on the right there, you see a photograph of his observatory. Um, and I was uh, rather surprised to come across this image. Uh, it's a, the original is an actual photograph and it's um, hidden away, shall we say, in the Basil Brown archive at the Suffolk Record Office, which is principally an archeological uh, archive. So when you're doing research um, at archives and county record offices and so on, you're never really quite sure what you're going to find. It's very easy for things to get misfiled. Here are two more photographs that, that were in the uh, same collection showing the eyepiece end of his telescope and a, a gentleman looking through the telescope. Um, when you look at the original picture in the, the bottom left corner um, on the mounting there, you, you can see the, the cast in name of Cook. So you know it, it, it's a Cook refractor. Um, the identity of the gentleman there is, is unknown, but I, I assume it's uh, Arthur Bennett himself. So he, he served uh, various posts within the BIA, um, but unfortunately he died rather unexpectedly in, in 1937. Um, and so he, he's uh, not made any sort of really lasting uh, contributions to the BIA. Here is um, Edward Collinson. So he was born in Ipswich early in the 20th century, um, but at a young age, his parents packed him off to the Bootham School in York. Uh, the school had a, an astronomical society. I believe they had a small refract, refracting telescope that the pupils could use. Um, and so from early childhood, he was really into astronomy. Um, as you can see there, I've, I've put a note that he observed meteors photographically and um, I'll go into that in more detail later. Um, as you can see, he was uh, not only Mars section director there, but BAA president, um, but his profession was, was that of uh, solicitor. Um, and for many, many years, he gave free legal advice um, to the BAA. In 1979, he decided that not only was he going to retire from section directorship of the Mars section, um, but also from legal practice and uh, he sent a, a very apologetic letter to the BIA at the time saying, well, I'm sorry, I'm no longer in the loop, legally speaking, and you'll have to find uh, legal advice elsewhere in the future. Um, and as you can see there, he was also uh, president of the Ipswich and District Astronomical Society um, later on um, following uh, Clarkson. Um, here's another another uh, solicitor, uh, JPM Prentice. So he's born in the same year as uh, Collinson, um, but he was born in Stowe Market and he was packed off to a Gresham's School. Um, <clears throat> Gresham's School, uh, quite an interesting uh, um, place that uh, it started off as a religious house of education and when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, they were able to continue independently. And so even down to today, it's an independent boarding school. Uh, Prentice was there between 1915 and 1921. The school had a natural history society, uh, part of which was an astronomical section. And again, from uh, school, he was interested in astronomy. 
and he came into the BIA and he directed the Meteor section between 1923 and 1954. And of course, um, at that time, uh, spacecraft had yet to be invented and so uh, look going out at night looking up counting meteors was one of the few ways that you could actually probe the interplanetary medium to know what there was going around the sun apart from the big planets he's very much regarded as grace cook's protege um, doing most of what he of what she did but going very much further than, than she went in the subject. And he became sufficiently familiar with the night sky that he discovered this object called DQ Hercules. So uh, a nova in Hercules, although uh, when it was discovered, um, Prentice actually said he was actually in Draco. Um, and that was in the winter of 1932. Following his discovery. Um, <clears> he <throat> observed through the night, um, took a few hours sleep and then went into his office the next day. Uh, the next day he was contacted by the BBC for an interview. Um, he got somewhat uh, microphone shy at this point and said, no, 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 I can't possibly do this. Uh, you'll have to find somebody else. The BBC then thought of the best known astronomer in the country and they went to Greenwich and asked the Astronomer Royal for a few comments on this new object. And uh, Prentice said, well, I, I think they got a much better interviewee than I'd have ever been able to do. But um, Prentice really regarded himself as a visual observer. And following the Second World War, army surplus um, material um, and RF surplus material in terms of optical equipment and indeed radar equipment, became available and Prentice decided at that point he no longer wished to continue in astronomy um, and he went off into other subjects. Here's the, uh, the very last person that uh, Grace Cook uh, enrolled into the BAA, a chap called George Alcock. So he's um, slightly younger than the people I've already been talking about. He's born in 1912 in Peterborough. But um, his observing career was um, kind of the opposite of Basil Brown's. Basil Brown was an astron amateur astronomer at a young age and then had to give it up. Uh, Alcock is kind of the other way around. That although he was interested in, in astronomy um, and he went to teach a training college to be a school teacher, um, he couldn't get any employment as a teacher early in his life. Um, and so he couldn't really do in astronomy um, what he wanted to do and had, he had to wait for his life to settle down um, before he could do uh, what he wanted to do in his spare time. So um, what he did, well, in the final analysis, he discovered five comets and also five novae. Um, a nova is an extreme example of a variable star. So the sun that we go round on an annual basis is remarkably constant, gives the same output year after year after year. Not all stars are like that. Some are brighter and then they go dimmer and they get brighter again. Um, as I just said, Novi are an extreme example of this, that they're uh, comparatively faint for decades, maybe centuries, and then they suddenly flare up into brightness. Um, to go back to Prentice's discovery of DQ Hercules, Alcock and, and Prentice were very much observing colleagues, and Alcock was observing on the same night that Prentice discovered DQ Hercules. Um, but he had uh, morning lessons to teach the next day at school and went to bed early. And so he failed to discover DQ Hercules. And it was always in the back of his mind, even up to his dying day, well, if I'd have stayed on and kept observing, would I have got it before Prentice? So in um, 
the early 20th century, there was agitation um, for increased rights for women in this country, with the suffragettes pushing for the vote for women. Uh, the Royal Astronomical Society uh, tried to re resist this um, pressure for as long as possible, but uh, in 1915, um, their uh, charter, which, which they had, um, they had an additional charter written to allow women to become fellows. These kind of last defence of the RAS to prevent women becoming fellows was that their charter was always written around the male pronoun. It always referred to fellows either as he or him. And they said, well, we can't have any female fellows literally because our charter always refers to men. But the charter uh, was, I uh, say, there was a new charter in late in 1915, which would allow women full fellowship of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, prior to this, because the RAS goes back to 1820, there had been a few honorary female members, but they couldn't uh, attend meetings, couldn't uh, give papers, couldn't join in discussions. And so here we are in January 1916, and I've uh, included a screenshot there from the monthly notices of the RAS for the meeting held on the 14th of January. And along with a, with a couple of male names, the first ladies are elected as fellows of the RAS. And so you can see the first name because the names are done alphabetically is that of Mary Blagg. Um, she was particularly interested in lunar formations and selenography. Um, then there's a lady called Ella Church, um, which I don't know much about her. I'm still trying to find out um, uh, particularly details of her life. But the third on the list there is our Alice Grace Cook of Stowmarket. Further down the list, uh, we come to Irene Warner, who lived in Bristol. And lastly, M Mrs. Firemetta Wilson, who um, I've already mentioned. So in um, <clears throat> 1915, when the possibility of the female fellows became a, a very real possibility, the uh, gentleman at the top of amateur astronomy in this country kind of looked around and said, well, well, who would I like to elect to the RAS? And so, for example, Ella Church, we can relate directly to a, a man called the Reverend T.E.R. Phillips um, and Grace Cook, um, through her work on meteors, was proposed by uh, William Denning in Bristol. And Denning also uh, offered for fellowship this uh, lady, Irene Warner. Um, they only lived a, a few minutes, a few miles apart in Bristol. So here's Alice Grace Cook's um, particular discovery in astronomy, that of an ANOVA, um, similar to the one discovered several years later by Prentice, but this was in the constellation of Aquila. So it's just about dusk, on a Saturday evening, that of the 8th of June, 1918. And as she goes out to observe that evening, Grace Cook looks into the sky and she can see a star which wasn't there the night before. Um, <clears throat> she has a copy of a book called Klein's Star Atlas. Um, this is only 1918 and the ubiquitous Norton's Star Atlas has yet to come into use. And she wrote down uh, on the particular star map uh, this, the point of, of this uh, discovery. But of course, um, as an object uh, brightens um, itself in, in the sky, there's kind of a, uh, an advantage to being further east rather than further west. Uh, it's too, the object's too dim to be seen on any particular night, 
but during the day it brightens up and so if you're further east sunset will occur correspondingly earlier and you get a better chance to see it and so the object was first seen from India by this chap called George Bauer who was in the Indian civil service and it was said that he was just showing casually the night sky to a friend of his and they both saw a star which Bauer couldn't identify um, so it it was kind of reconstructed by from later events that he was the first one to see this object but Grace Cook was the one perhaps the first in the UK to see it and she was followed by Denning at Bristol uh, William Herbert Stevenson and a couple of other astronomers around the country the object uh, turned out to be the brightest nova of the 20th century and it peaked at around magnitude minus 0.5. Uh, it is of sufficient interest to variable star observers that it was later given a variable star uh, designation that you see there. Um, <clears throat> the discovery uh, projected Grace Cook's name onto the national stage and you see an image of her on the right here taken uh, from the Daily Mirror newspaper and it shows Grace Cook uh, in a typical observing position uh, sitting on a deck chair with a blanket over her knees um, and you can't actually see it in this image but there's a notebook resting on her lap for her to note down the uh, meteors or shooting stars as she sees them so it's uh, when you saw it um, and the start position and the end position of the trail and the brightness of the object that you're looking to record Um, here's the light curve of the Nova. So you can see it peaks at perhaps just below magnitude minus one, um, which probably makes it bright as something like the planet Saturn. And then over the next few weeks, the BIA meteor, uh, variable star section observers recorded it night after night after night. And so by the time we get down to the end of July, it's down to about magnitude four. Um, <clears throat> Grace Cook's father died in 1917 at the age of 75. And in 1920, the family, the widow and daughters uh, moved from the rookery, which I've shown you uh, an image of uh, a few slides ago, which is shown in the upper red circle there. They moved down the road, but still stayed in Stowe Market to a house called The Grove. And Grace Cook's father, his death seems to precipitate change in the Cook family. The business of milling and malting that he owned uh, seems to have been split between his two sons. And um, they had their own families to look after. And so uh, their mother and Grace Cook and her, her sister Mabel um, seem to kind of get shut out from the rest of the family. Um, there's certainly their finances uh, go on a certainly very deep downward spiral. And the, the first mark of this, this downward passage is moving from the rookery um, down the road to the grove. <clears throat> In 1920, Grace Cook visited the Orwell Park Observatory. And so uh, you heard from the introduction um, that I'm a licensed operator of this telescope that you see in the center top there. So this is a uh, 10 inch aperture, 12 feet focal length refractor uh, by uh, Troughton and Sims. The object class is by Mertz of Mar uh, Munich in Germany. <clears throat> and it is an extreme example of a grand Victorian gentleman's private observatory. The chap who had it built, a chap called Colonel Tomlin, was to put it bluntly, 
stinking rich. If he got an idea to do something, then he just went for it in the most extreme way possible. He was interested in astronomy and he decided to have his private house or one of his private houses, I should say, extended and an observatory added to the end. He wrote to the Astronomer Royal in London asking for advice on what an observatory should look like. And the Astronomer Royal wrote at the time wrote back to him and said, well, actually, I'm a bit busy operating this country's national observatory. But uh, my son is an engineer and he will be able to give you advice on what you should build. So <clears throat> Victorian observatories um, were often built on towers. Um, this one is none too far from the River Orwell. And so it was felt that if the observatory uh, dome itself was on, up on about the fourth or fifth floor level, it would be uh, raised above mists coming up from the river. So Grace Cook visited this observatory uh, to observe the planet Saturn in March 1920. The idea was to observe the planet. Um, and you see she's uh, put a sketch of, the, of Saturn there and dated it March the 12th. And the idea was to reobserve the planet on the 14th of March when the planet was due to occult a star. Unfortunately, the weather on the evening of the 14th uh, was not sufficiently good to carry on the observations. In fact, I believe it was actually raining that night. Um, so the project was abandoned, but the occultation was observed from elsewhere around the world. And she revisited the observatory um, in May 1920 when herself and a group of friends observed an eclipse of the moon. So here I've um, put up a list of meteor section directors within the British Astronomical Association. As I said earlier, the BAA itself started in 1890. And indeed, for the first 25 years of its existence, if you were a lady and interested in astronomy, virtually the only vehicle for your interest was the BAA. So the first meteor section director was a chap called David Booth. He came from Leeds in Yorkshire. Um, he only directed the section for a couple of years um, and then he's moved out of astronomy. Um, I don't think he died until about the 1930s. The second director was a chap called Henry Corder. He was actually born in Ipswich in Suffolk, none too far from where Grace Cook comes from. But at the time he was a section director, he was in, living in Bridgewater in Somerset. As you can see, the name Denning reappears here as a section director, uh, but he only had the section for about a year from 1899 until 1900. The next director is Walter Besley. Uh, he took on the section in 1900. He was a relatively young man, only in his 20s himself. Um, he directed the section up until 1905. And this is when, uh, unfortunately, um, the section goes into serious decline. Um, Besley himself died of consumption, or as we would say now, tuberculosis. The next director, a lady for the first time, was Catherine Stevens. Um, quite why the BAA uh, presented her with meteor section directorship, I don't know. She was principally a solar observer. Um, so she did very little work within the section for the next six, six years until the chap that I've shown here on the right, the Reverend Davidson, turns up. Um, he's somewhat a knight in shining armour for the meteor section in that uh, in 1911, he's not only a, uh, sec become the section director, but he actually joined the BIA and was elected a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society all in one year. 
Um, he was section director up until 1921 when he turned the section over to Grace Cook. Um, she had it for a relatively few years um, in the early 1920s, but as I've already said, this was a period of decline in her life, so um, she couldn't carry on herself, but turned it over to her observing protege, Prentice. Um, the Mar uh, Martin Davidson, as you can see there, is a reverend gentleman. And so in the First World War, in uh, 1916, he regarded it as his uh, patriotic and indeed church duty to uh, leave the UK, travel to France and minister to the soldiers uh, on the Western Front. And so for a period during the First War, he uh, left the section in the care of Grace Cook and Fiametta Wilson jointly. The way the BIA originally operated was that the observing section directors would receive observations from members and then at a suitable period um, publish these things called observing memoirs. And so in the early history of the meteor section, they appear in 1891, then 1894, and then under Besley's uh, directorship, they appear at an annual basis until his death in 1905. Grace Cook did manage to produce one observing memoir for herself in 1923, and then it's not until Prentice's, Prentice's directorship, in, the next one appears in 1936. Following the Second World War, the BAA reviewed its activities and decided that these observing memoirs are really quite expensive to produce um, on um, kind of an ad hoc basis as, as when the section directors uh, could supply material. And so these days, uh, observing reports just appear in the journal. So Grace Cook's meteor observing career. Um, she joined the BIA in February 1911. Her first observing report appears in August of the same year. And she's reporting more or less on a monthly basis right up until January 1923. So that's, you know, 10 or 12 years observing. Her final meteor observations are published in the autumn of 1931, but up to the end of 1938, there is an occasional mention of her seeing an aurora. So just going out, looking up, oh yes, that's an aurora, I know what that is, I'll report that to the BAA. And so these, um, the work behind these observing reports amounts to something like 20 or 30 hours observing every month. This is the kind of equipment uh, that uh, Grace Cook and her observing colleagues were using. Um, on the left there, you see a thing called a, a meteoroscope. Um, and this was supposed to make the work of determining the start and end positions of a shooting star's track across the night sky easier. Um, there's one or two mentions of it, and then it kind of disappears from the literature. So you get the impression it wasn't that successful a device. On the right, um, you see one of Edward Collinson's meteor cameras. So whereas Prentice would, would stay up all night uh, manually observing meteors, Collinson um, would set cameras to work at dusk and then go to sleep himself, and then wake up in the morning, collect the glass plates from the cameras and then develop them himself. Um, these were somewhat Heath Robinson and extremely basic cameras. Um, you can see there that it's obviously sitting on an equatorial mount, so it can track the night sky. Um, the thing is actually weight driven as its source of energy. And in the center there, you can see the device that he came up with to change the uh, plates on an hourly basis. So the camera is looking at the night sky, which is quite low light levels, and you're looking for a bright transient object. So the fact that you don't actually bother to close the shutter 
while you change the plates is, is kind of irrelevant. It just, the plate changer just jumps around to the next one and you expose it for however long. Um, in the history of astronomy, no doubt you've heard of the canals of Mars. Uh, and observing, shall we say, dead end it seemed like a good idea at the time, but the evidence really didn't match uh, what was really hoped for it. And the same is true in meteor observing, that we have these things called stationary radiance, uh, points in the night sky that were supposed to produce uh, shooting stars for months at a time. And it's now thought that these uh, don't exist at all. And it was just kind of coincidences between random meteors that produced them. But Grace Cook and uh, Prentice did discover their own meteor stream, the Gamma Acrid stream, um, which they discovered independently in September of 1921. Unfortunately, it's rather a weak stream, only producing one to four meteors per hour. I like to try and imagine what happened on the day when uh, one of them would have visited the other and said, oh, I've discovered this new meteor stream. And the other one would have turned around and said, well, so, so have I. In uh, the early 1920s, um, there was a, a, a grant available in America called the Edward Pickering Fellowship. So Pickering was one of the first astronomers to use uh, female astronomers to carry out the work, not only of observing with telescopes, but also um, working on the data that had already been amassed. The award was for $500, and it was to uh, allow, uh, cover living expenses while you went to Harvard College Observatory um, and worked on the data there. For the first time in 1920, it was to be presented to somebody outside the US. And it said that as the letter crossed the Atlantic, um, destined for Fire Meta Wilson in Northwest London, that she was um, on her deathbed, moving from this world to the next, which gave the fellowship something of a problem, uh, who to give the money to. And so they lighted on uh, Grace Cook. Now I can understand why uh, Fire Meta Wilson uh, would have been could have used the money in that she was a very independent lady. She'd already travelled to America several times, and she'd easily been able to go to the observatory and work there. Uh, Grace Cook, I don't think ever spent more than a night outside the county of Suffolk herself, and so she used the money to buy a typewriter and to convert her membership of the BIA into life membership. And she also bought some star maps and accessories for a telescope. So although she was a member of the BIA until the day she died in 1958, the fellowship of the Royal Astronomical Society that she gained in 1916, she gave up in 1923. Um, so it would seem to me that she didn't regard putting FRAS after her name as being particularly useful to her. She joined several other astronomical societies. Um, I'll just uh, highlight uh, the first and the last one there. So the Society of Astronomy d'Anvers is the Belgian Astronomical Society. And during the First World War, when the uh, German forces under the Kaiser overran Belgium, um, those that could uh, escaped, uh, some came to the UK and uh, it was seen to be the duty of astronomers within the astronomical community to um, join this society to support their Belgian colleagues. Um, the last society there, the Chaldean Society, existed um, in the 1920s um, and, and it, it's very much a basic astronomical society, unlike the BAA where you kind of needed a, a big telescope and probably a big reflector to be interested in a particular object in the night sky. So here's the magazine of the Chaldean Society, um, produced um, at various frequencies during society's life. 
sometimes uh, quarterly, sometimes monthly. Um, here's the uh, program of work that they undertook. So appearance of planets after conjunction with the sun, uh, observations of the planet Mercury, uh, observations of minor planets, naked eye comets, or perhaps Uranus, the brighter variable stars, atmospheric phenomena such as rainbows and halos. Um, and the last one, which is, um, seems to me a uh, particularly uh, difficult object, uh, project to carry on, that of um, mapping the Milky Way. In the 1920, the management, the President Society changed and the incoming gentleman said, well, what we really need to do is to diversify the society. We've got members all over the country, um, but we only hold meetings in London, which can be attended by relatively few people. And so if there's somebody in a particular town who wants to get going locally, then we will support them. And, and you can see the list of branches there that appeared, and one of which was the Ipswich branch in the winter of 1922. Here are the founder members. Um, as you can see, there's um, names of, of quite a few people I've already mentioned there. Um, in Suffolk, we have a unique resource to draw on in that we can actually examine the original minute book from this society uh, through an absolute fluke of history it's been preserved in the Suffolk record office so this is the building they met in the museum in Ipswich um, and uh, meetings were held here um, approximately every month um, not only was there a section in Ipswich but there was also a subsection in Stowmarket. So Alice Grace Cook essentially had her own astronomical society and she was assisted in the running of the society uh, by JPM Prentice. Um, Prentice um, lived at the uh, house highlighted in red at the top there, Temple Road. And initially, um, Grace Cook lived at the Grove and the first meeting of the, of the Stone Market section of the Chaldean Society was held at the Grove. Um, but money was getting ever and ever tighter for, for Grace Cook. And so she had to move um, from uh, the Grove down to 44 Ipswich Road. So here we see the Grove. Um, it's currently a care home. Um, so you can just kind of peek over the wall and, and take a photograph, and that's about as much as you can do. Uh, number two, Temple Road, uh, is also known as Redcroft, and so that's still a private house. Um, and the meetings, I say, were originally held at the Grove, um, but at, uh, later at the Redcroft. Um, JPM Prentice was sufficiently young at this time that he was still living um, with his parents, and so they uh, hosted the meetings on his behalf. Not only was there a section, uh, a subsection of the Ipswich branch at Stowe Market, there was also one in a very small Suffolk village called Yoxford. Essentially only uh, revolved around this one lady called Mrs. Flaxman. Um, and it was said that she was often to be seen out in the streets or the nearby fields at night, looking at the night sky. And if there was an interesting astronomical event coming up, um, she would get a piece of paper and draw a kind of a, a poster of what people could expect to see and put it in her window so that passers-by would know what was happening astronomically. Um, unfortunately, um, having got the section going, uh, she died in 1923 um, and the uh, society kind of died with her. Perhaps one of the easiest um, events to see, if you've only got a very small telescope or none at all, um, either solar or lunar eclipses. And so the Chaldean Society observed the eclipse of uh, the 
8th of April, 1921. And so you can see from the track there that it was annular over Northern Scotland and then a deep partial across the east of the UK. The society got an expedition together and they went to uh, Loch Maddy up in the Hebrides. Um, and this is an image they got of the eclipsed sun. Um, from Suffolk, uh, we have reports from four observers. Um, the numbers on the left there are reference numbers to the observing station. <clears throat> so Grace Cook uh, saw it from Stowe Market using a six inch reflector. Um, she'd already given back the Pennington refractor by this time, but the six inch reflector was a, a gift to her from Hardcastle and she seems to have retained it for the whole of her observing career. Um, as you can see, Clarkson and Collinson also observed it. And Collinson um, came up with this rather novel technique uh, for observing the eclipse that he got a piece of photographic paper and then timed with a stopwatch how long it took to go from unexposed to completely exposed. And so you can see at uh, five to eight in the morning there, it's taking four seconds. And then by the time you get up to five to nine in the morning and the eclipse is proceeded on, it's taking nearer um, sort of about nine seconds to go to the same uh, level. So he's, he's using photographic paper um, to record the light level. So here's an image of uh, 44 Ipswich Road uh, on the left. And you, as you can see, it's very much more a modest house uh, compared to the grove and indeed the rookery. Um, but later in her life, uh, Grace Cook lived in Finborough Road at this uh, bungalow that she named Sunlit. So uh, coming now to a, a summary of her astronomical career, uh, she gave lectures in Ipswich. She wrote papers for astronomical journals and indeed meeting report, uh, observing reports for the BIA. She wrote to local newspapers. Um, this is quite an easy subject to research in the history of astronomy. You know when an eclipse occurred uh, or a transit of Venus or a transit of Mercury. And so you can look uh, sort of in the days and weeks before the event to see if anybody is writing letters to newspapers to raise people's interest in the subject. And you know the exact date the event takes place. And so um, if letters and contributions after that will be meeting reports from people to say, yes, I did see it or no, I never didn't see it. And of course, lastly, as, as I've already shown, uh, she recruited members to the BIA. Um, Grace Cook's literary output uh, in astronomy is sufficient that we can do some kind of analysis. And you say so you can see there from her introduction to astronomy in 1911 up until the early 1920s, um, she's writing for the uh, British Astronomical Association, uh, both the journal and the memoirs that I've shown in red. Um, there's a little bit of uh, contributions to local newspapers that, that I've shown in blue. Um, and then she's also writing to a magazine called The English Mechanic, um, which was a kind of a, a general uh, science and engineering magazine of the time. And then there's a few other contributions to things like the monthly notices of the RAS. And then from 1924 onwards, um, she's really not producing anything up until the early 1930s, when there's this quite prodigious output of uh, newspaper articles so this is uh, for a newspaper called the Stowe Market Recorder, a local newspaper to Stowe Market. She's writing on astronomy and natural history and travel in a weekly column. And I suspect that she was doing this merely to earn money. But again, there's a sudden halt in 1939 
when the Second World War broke out, the local newspaper just simply stopped publication. And so she could no longer uh, earn any money from there. And so my final slide is an overview of her life. Um, she was born in Stowe Market in 1877. Um, as probably quite a mature young lady in 1911, she joined the BAA. This was followed five years later by becoming one of the first female fellows of the RAS. She was for a period a, a temporary co-director of the BAA meteor section. She joined the Leeds Astronomical Society in 1918. She discovered an ovary quilly in the summer of 1918. In 1920, she received the Edward Pickering Fellowship. She was a member of the Chaldean Society through the 1920s and indeed operated her own section at Stowe Market uh, at the same time as being Meteor Section Director for the BAA. In 1921, she discovered, shall we say, her own meteor stream. And then post-war, uh, still interested in, in astronomy, although not actually able to uh, contribute much. She was a founder member of the Ipswich and District Astronomical Society in 1950. And she died in Ipswich in 1958. Um, at this point, I would like to acknowledge various uh, places that I've carried out research. So that's the Suffolk Record Office um, in Ipswich, the British Library in London, the Royal Astronomical Society, also in London, the Radcliffe Science Library at the University of Oxford, and lastly, the National Library of Scotland. And at that point, I will uh, stop talking and I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. What a fascinating woman. Right, questions, ladies and gentlemen. While you're thinking uh, about questions, uh, I've got one for you, Bill. Uh, the Franklin, the Franklin Adams plates, uh, the collection yes. of the plates, do they still exist? I don't honestly know. I, I would certainly imagine they do. I can't see a particular reason why they would have been either destroyed or lost. Um, obviously, once you've produced um, a photograph, um, such as the one I showed, it, it could be copied. So. Um, I, I would certainly imagine the RAS in London um, would, would have a set. Um, the um, Royal Greenwich Observatory, uh, I believe, archive still exists. It, it's kind of uh, within the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge. Um, I'd imagine there would be a set there as well. Okay. It would just be interesting to see if there were some... Uh, uh, Reper reproductions of them available for uh, amateur astronomers to compare and contrast. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any that are on what you might call the public domain, no. Right, okay. Uh, so, ladies and gents, I'm looking for questions. Uh, Roy Gunson, mm -hmm. could you unmute yourself, Roy? Yeah, uh, I was interested in, the, you showed a slide with a, a piece of kit called a, a meteoscope. And I wondered if there was any uh, existing uh, examples of that around anywhere. I don't believe so, no. Um, I imagine on, only a prototype or, or one or two were produced. Um, it was reported on um, within the journal of the BIA um, and it was supposed to be somewhat useful. But of course, you're comparing a, 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 an instrument um, with people who've been observing meteors, you know, for, for many, many years, and they're really very practiced at it. And it, it's hard to see how an instrument would improve um, the accuracy of observation. Because you're, you're still, it, it's only a, a, an aid to you looking into the night sky and noting the start and end point of, of a track of a shooting star as it passes through your field of vision. Mm. It just seemed a bit a strange piece of kit, you know, and I wondered how they how they could handle it. While I mean, a meteor is a, a very quick event to set anything up to do any sort of measurements. 
and of course you're 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 trying to observe um you know dark as adapted as possible and yet you you certainly in those days you you had a, a pencil and notebook in front of you and a, you know it's kind of a dimmer light as you could get away with because you're having to write down notes as to what you saw it, it's also quite amazing to me that um in in this day and age <clears throat> if if you well you you, you have, these days you have people with all sky cameras um, a camera just looking at the night sky and if there's a meteor then it gets recorded you know downloaded into the computer as it were um, and of course the computer knows the time to within a fraction of a second and so two all sky cameras um, in different locations can easily record the same meteor um, you know we just had this thing called the Winchcombe meteorite. So it was observations of an extremely bright shooting star. You can uh, produce the plot of the meteor through the Earth's atmosphere, and then you can project it onto the ground to say where the meteorite would land, and then you go out and look for it. But even in the 1920s, the BAA meteor section were producing... Um, what they're called accordances. So it's two different people observing the same meteor and how this was done just with people writing things down on bits of paper and looking at a pocket watch to get the time. I've really got no idea. Thank you. Okay, Roy. Yep, thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Andy Deavy. Can you unmute yourself, please, Andy? Thank That's you. Thank you for an excellent talk. My, my question's a practical one. I've never ever looked through a Victorian refractor. So the observatory that um, you are affiliated to and, and uh, have the custodian of, how does the instrument compare to modern telescopes? And could you give us a rough comparison as to which modern telescope it would more or less equal? Um, so it, it, it's a, a 10 inch refractor. Um, <clears throat> the original owner was, was a, a grand amateur and it seems that he, yes, he was interested in astronomy, but he was also very interested in showing off how wealthy he was. And so, um, if, if you remember the, the image of the inside of the dome, um, there were uh, astronomical telescope domes in the 19th century actually made of papier-mâché because all the dome just keeps the weather off. Mm -hmm. And so a bit of chicken wire and some mushed up newspaper slapped on the outside and you paint it to keep stop it from going mouldy kind of thing. It's perfectly serviceable, but not, not Colonel Tomlin, no. He, he had a, a lovely copper dome and it's lined on the inside in mahogany, one of the most expensive hardwoods you can have. So it was kind of a, 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 a method of him showing his weekend party guests how, how uh, wealthy he was. Um, the uh, object glass of the telescope is a doublet. Um, it's reasonably well uh, colour corrected, but... Um, if certainly if you look at a, a bright star through through it, there's a distinct uh, purple uh, fringe around the star. Um, the uh, house uh, was owned by Colonel Tomlin up to the time when he died in 1889. Uh, it subsequently went down through his family. And in the 1930s, um, it became a private school. Um, at one point, uh, I think it was in the 1920s, the family tried to sell the telescope, um, you know, in the height of the depression, anywhere they could get money from kind of thing. Um, a chap called um, Dr. Stevenson came along, who uh, claimed to have looked through every telescope in the UK at the time. And he said, well, yes, it, it's a very big aperture, but it's not a very good lens and you really can't do the highest quality work with this. Um, when the Royal Astronomical Society was founded in the late 60s, um, the object glass was 
uh, refigured by a chap called Horace Dahl. And uh, more recently, a chap called Ed S. Reed has also refigured it. Um, so it's, it's probably in as good a state now as it's ever been. But, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it'll show you the, the bright planets. Um, certainly Pluto's been observed through it. Um, one or two quasars you can see through it, um, certainly if you're, you're recording electronically. So it, it's got good light grasp. But unfortunately, um, Colonel Tommin's other claim to fame is that he started Felix Doe Docks. And Nacton Observatory is only about five miles from the dock, so it does really suffer from light pollution. Um, but it's a lovely telescope to use. As you can see, it's a very long focal ratio. Um, and so it's very forgiving of, of um, focusing. You know, you can turn the, the focus screw quite a bit and the image stays reasonably sharp. Um, so the telescope is the original, but unfortunately over the years, all the original eyepieces have disappeared. And so it's a kind of a bit of a hybrid now that we have to use modern eyepieces um, with uh, kind of this, this grand old lady, as we call her. So, um, yeah, um, I wouldn't, I'm not particularly uh, familiar with looking through lots and lots of different telescopes to say what, what it's actually equivalent to, though. OK, thank you. OK, anybody with any other questions? Oh, well, whilst you're thinking then, uh, Bill, uh, Alice, uh, Alice Cook's uh, gentle descent through uh, living conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. What was actually going off there? I mean, her father died. Uh, did she not have a, uh, a job or no. uh, other income? Um, so she uh, went to uh, the grammar school in Bury St Edmunds. So she had, you know, kind of a secondary education, um, but neither her, her mother nor her sister, nor herself, have in any census are ever recorded as being employed. So I kind of imagine while her father was alive that, that he was looking after everybody in the family. Um, and then after he died, I imagine the, the business was a kind of split between the two sons. Um, what I didn't highlight there was um, that one of the sons actually um, ended up in the county lunatic asylum um, in, and died in the mid-1930s. And rather sadly, his estate at the time was valued at a pityingly small five pounds. Um, and so I imagine that kind of the business went down to the, to the other son, um, who obviously had his own wife and, and, and children to look after. And of course, this is before the welfare state. Um, and I imagine, although I've got no actual record, that, that it kind of ended up with Grace Cook and to an extent her sister looking after their, their extremely aged mother. Because there were no um, care homes or anything at the time, you see. And uh, what happened to the Cook business? Uh, did it, is it still around in any form or is it, uh, did it go defunct? Uh, it, yes, it, it went defunct, I think, from memory. Again, it was in the 1930s in the Depression. Okay. You wouldn't have thought that a flour mill would go defunct, even in the, in the mm. Depression, but uh, there you have it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm looking around for any other questions. Oh, uh, well, I'd like right. Bill Muffet's question. Bill Muffet's got a question for you, Bill. Yes. Hi, hi, hi Bill. Lovely talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. More of a general, wider question. Uh, how do you see astronomy clubs have changed over the past hundred or so years, and do you think we need to change or modify what we do to keep going, and and our corporate? keep people interested in being, being club members? Um, well, certainly a hundred years ago, uh, or just over a hundred years ago, um, women were excluded from the RAS. Um, and so this is one of the functions of the BAA. Um, and indeed, there, there were other astronomical societies around at the time. Um, the BAA was probably a bit of an elite group um, in the 1920s, which is 
kind of why I think this Chaldean society got going. It, it was kind of for people who just wanted to go out and look up and know what star they were looking at. Um, to an extent, I would say that, that COVID has, has actually assisted astronomical societies. Um, you know, uh, pre-COVID, <laughs> you'd actually have to travel to a meeting. Um, but now we're all online. Um, it's very much easier to um, uh, go to a meeting. You know, you just, just sit at home and um, dial in, as it were. Um, but yes, there's... Uh, um, there is, uh, shall we say, an, an aging demographic within society, within astronomical societies. Um, certainly the, the groups that I'm a member of, um, you see very few young people and you think, well, you know, when all the uh, elderly people have, have shuffled off this mortal coil, what, what will actually be left kind of thing? So in, in a way good and in a way not good. Um, yeah, don't know if that answered are. your question. Yeah, it kind of, kind of does, yeah. We, we've experienced a similar thing over the past 40 years. We were all teenagers at one time and a few older people, and it's kind of shifted around. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's like, you know, what what do you do to keep younger people interested? I know, I know younger people are interested, but they're not interested in clubs, and I can't quite get my head around it. Mm hmm uh, my my son's sixteen, and he's interested in space flight, and 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 things like that. But he's not interested in being in an astronomy club or no. any club whatsoever, mm. <laughs> no matter what I say to him. But yeah, yeah, and I think it's a common problem that's going around. But yeah, it, 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 I, I think there's more more things out there for people to be interested in in astronomy, and no more stuff. Uh, and, and I think the pictures and the photography and people involved in astronomy is more diverse, but not at younger age. And I, and no. I can't quite understand that. Um, no. but it, 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 it's probably something we can blame the internet for <laughs> because certainly years ago, if you wanted to be if interested in astronomy, you know, uh, certainly when I was a school child, you either went to the school library or the town library or you joined the local astronomical society. They exactly. were your only sources of information, apart maybe from Sky at Night with Patrick Moore on the TV. Mm. Um, but now we all have the internet and if you're interested in something in a casual way, you know, you can just type into Wikipedia or whatever and find out stuff. True, that's really true. I've but you don't get the social interaction. What got me, what's kept me interested in our society, it's social interaction, meeting people, comparing notes, and doing stuff together. And kids aren't doing that now. No. I've got to say, Phil, uh, Phil that uh, our youngest members just had to go to bed. So <laughs> it's past his bedtime. So uh, we're, not, we're not doing too badly. Um, can, I just, can I just jump in, uh, Paul? Yes, you can. Just, just, just on what Phil was saying. A lot of the school children during the pandemic have been having to resort to online teaching, presumably via Zoom. We are doing online astronomy via Zoom. This is an avenue that should be explored to see if we can match the two together somehow. I quite agree, Andy. It's, it just, it just uh, needs a lot of thought putting into it. Yeah, it does. And it's it's already a conversation that the uh, the society's executive has started, and we're already exploring how we're going to marry the two together. And I think it is a case of marrying the two models together rather than deciding to go either back into the physical physical world entirely or go, remaining on Zoom. There is an there is an important. Um, there are important characteristics of the physical meeting that cannot be replicated in a video conference uh, situation like we've got here. So I think it is a case of marrying the two models together rather than going one or the other. It uh, is because if, if you can get them interested in one end, then the benefits of the actual social interaction at a later stage or at the observatory come later. But the thing is to get them involved in the first place, isn't it? That's right. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Mexprin Swinton, well, I don't think I know that Mexprin Swinton are very lucky 
in that we do have the uh, the J.A. Jones Observatory and we have some uh, high quality equipment up there. Uh, you know, the, our, our two telescopes, our mount, our uh, digital camera uh, that is available to members. You, most of us could not afford uh, that equipment. And, you know, for the price of a membership every year, I know our membership's a little higher than most societies' memberships, but for the price of the membership, you get access to uh, that equipment uh, and the ability to do some uh, really good astronomy. The, uh, you know, the one, I know that it's uh, an issue with the exec as well, is that one of the things is that uh, we'd like to see uh, improving is the use of the uh, observatory because very often uh, it was only getting used maybe two or three times a week and maybe only for three or four hours a night uh, on those occasions. So, uh, yeah, we when we go back to uh, whatever normal's going to look like, <laughs> whenever we, we whenever we start the new normal, uh, we've got those issues to face and uh, and those uh, points to... Um, to address. Uh, Tony Morris, do you want to add anything, Tony, as uh, observatory curator? Your microphone's not on, Tony. Still can't hear you. Type it into the chat. And then you can... He's lost oh, date. Tony. He's lost date. <laughs> this is what happens when you retire from BT. You lose the ability to talk over communication channels. <laughs> okay. So uh, has anybody got any other comments? Uh, Graham? Well, yeah, only briefly about what you were saying about the observatory and the use of. I mean, we do this, have probably the same sort of problems or concerns, really, at Chesterfield as well. So it's the use of the yeah. telescope yeah. by the members more regularly. But... It, it it depends on the interest shown by the members and they've got to qualify to use it. But uh, yes, it's a good telescope, but it, 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 it's there to be used, but it's getting the people there to use it. Well, well, yes. And uh, um, I don't know what your night skies are like, Bill, around in your area. Are they reasonable? Um, well... Uh... Like I said, we, we have uh, Phoenix Toe Dock. Phoenix Toe Dock is actually not that bad because they are essentially a, a limited company and they're interested in profit. So they really are interested in shining light on the ground where they need it um, while they wait for the ever given to turn up, as it were, rather than uh, throw it up in the night sky. Um, but yes, we, we do have some pretty pristine um, skies. With, <coughs> um, the strip uh just in from the coast has been designated an area of outstanding natural beauty um and one of the things that the local astronomical societies have done um with the people who kind of oversee this this kind of thing is to actually have the the, the night sky included in the anob designation that's an excellent piece of work uh yeah so um up in South Yorkshire, we're not particularly dark. We don't have particularly dark skies uh, because of obviously it's an industrial mm. conurbation. Uh, luckily, our our local council have gone LED, um, and they finished that program uh, a couple of three years ago. Was it Phil? I think so. Yeah, it yeah. has made a difference. It's and it has made a made difference. A difference. Mm. And yeah. uh, it's interesting to see all. It will be interesting to see what happens when uh, Sheffield and Barnsley councils have also started their LED lighting system, uh, process. Mm. Uh, I'm not but, too sure when Doncaster's are going if Doncaster's going to do it. The th thing is, though, Paul, and it's like going back to clubs and stuff. I enjoy doing some astronomy on my own, but I enjoy doing something as a group, depending on what's happening. Mm. But it's like Tony. Tony can take photographs. North American Nebula in the middle of Rotherham. Use photo techniques to get rid of the rubbish and come out with fantastic photo. So, oh, yes. so like pollution, 
I don't think is a bigger problem as what it used to be when we were using film. Oh, well, that's... <laughs> that's my fault. That's ancient history now, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've let uh, we've worked Bill really hard tonight. Uh, can we give him a big Mexican Swinton? Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Hope to see you again mm -hmm. soon, sir. Mm-hmm.